Hello and welcome to this video on sociology and social policy. A simple definition of social policy is anything the government puts into place, whether that be initiatives, plans, programs, laws and so on, to deal with or solve social problems. So the idea here is that the government would identify various issues within society and seek to solve those issues using social policy. Sociology is an academic subject which sets out to explore the way in which society operates and how it influences our lives. Sociological research concentrates on what is happening within society at any given time. So contemporary sociologists, when they're doing research, would very much be looking at the here and now, although they may, of course, also do longitudinal studies over a period of time, often starting now and going on for several years. This research can be used by governments to help them when planning social policies. So it's not unusual for various ministers or very de various departments to pick up sociologists' research and say, well, actually, the findings of this are quite useful and use it to back up their ideas when they're putting together policies. In terms of the positive view on this process, here we're thinking about the work of Giddens, who states that there are four practical benefits of studying sociology for society. It helps us to understand social situations. It provides us an awareness of cultural differences. It allows us to assess the effects of policies, so the impact they have, and increase our self-knowledge. These form a useful framework for understanding the relationship between sociology and social policy. So let's go into these in some more detail. In terms of understanding social situations, sociology allows us to understand the world around us, providing us with knowledge and insights. This understanding can take two forms. Firstly, the factual, providing us with the facts which allow us to form a judgment or develop a theory. Secondly, the theoretical, providing people with an explanation as to why something is happening. And in sociology, we are particularly interested in theory building and in either falsifying or in verifying various theories and their conclusions. An example of the way factual and theoretical understanding of social situations can influence social policy is the sociological study of poverty. So, factually, in the 1960s in the United Kingdom, politicians believed that they had eliminated poverty throughout the country. However, a series of reports in the 1980s and 1990s showed that poverty remained a huge but hidden problem within our society. Theoretically, we need to understand the facts on poverty. We need to understand the theory of it too. We need to know how poverty has been measured. And sociologists can then offer explanations for poverty based on their research. So they can start to say, well, this is why it happens, or this is how it can be prevented, or this is how we can perhaps ensure that we reduce it over time. The result of these pieces of research led to policies such as the minimum wage and tax credits being introduced by the new Labour government in the late 1990s. Next, the awareness of cultural differences. Sociology can help people to see things from others' points of view. So here, really, we're talking about that concept of Verstehen once again. A lack of awareness of the activities and beliefs of other groups can lead to prejudice and discrimination. The information sociology provides therefore allows us to respond to others' views in an informed and relevant way. So perhaps it is fair to understand that we all have our own viewpoint on the world, we all have our own personal culture and lived experience, and if we interact with someone who comes from a very different culture and has a very different lived experience, we may not initially understand them, their behaviours, their meanings, and so on and so forth. What sociology is very good at doing through its research is informing us and educating us about those differences so that then we can interact with those people on a more even basis, on a fairer basis. Next, the assessment of the effects of policies. So most government initiatives are evidence-based. When the government provides funding for new social projects, it requires the people actually running the project to provide clear evidence that there is some benefit coming from that particular programme. And this makes sense. So ultimately, if you're running some sort of project, just as if you're running a business, you're going to want to check in every now and again to make sure that it's running efficiently, that it's working as it should. And if there are any problems that you overcome those and that you spend money wisely. 
Sociology is the key subject in providing this sort of research into the relevance and effectiveness of policy initiatives. So in that sense, it is very powerful and very important. Finally, increasing self-knowledge. Increasing self-knowledge is key for most sociologists. Sociology allows people to reflect upon their own life experiences and initiate policies which are sympathetic to them. Certain groups, such as those with disabilities, minority ethnic groups and gay and feminist movements have all benefited from this aspect of sociology. Groups are then able to use sociological research to empower them and to empower their arguments and empower their debate with, say, the government or with policymakers for the need for change to occur. So in that sense, it's a very useful tool to have in your arsenal if you're trying to bring about positive change within society. In response to the positive view of Giddens, we have the critical view. This would argue that the relationship between social policy and sociology should be criticised and should be understood in a more critical light, that we should perhaps not simply take it at face value, that we need to delve beneath the surface and find out really what's going on. Critical sociologists such as Marxists believe that sociology has become too closely linked to the capitalist system, which, it, which to them is the main cause of social problems and discrimination. And as we know, Marxists argue, only through the creation of a classless communist society can we eradicate things such as sexism and racism and so on. Therefore, sociology is not providing knowledge that could help people, but in fact serve in the interests of powerful groups. And again, for Marxists in particular, this would be the bourgeoisie, the ruling class. Postmodernists such as Bauman argue that sociology has no contribution to make to policy, rather radically. They believe that the idea of an orderly and manageable society that exists palpably out there is an illusion. So Bauman's arguing here there is no society, there is no big object out there, no big thing out there which is society that acts upon us. In many ways we create it, so it's a invocation of that kind of interactionist idea with the postmodernist element that we as individuals decide what is true for ourselves. Therefore, there can be no link between sociology and social policy because there is no absolute truth. Sociology should be about people seeking out an understanding of their personal lives within a social context, and that's all it can ever be. It's just a tool for individuals to understand where they fit and what they want and how they wish to define themselves. It's not a tool to change the world and make it a better place. That's not possible because the modernist project of constant improvement and teleological progress is now dead. There is an assumption that if sociologists research social problems, governments will respond by seeking to solve the problem on the basis of the evidence. But again, this tends to be far too positive a viewpoint. And in particular, critical sociologists like Marxists or feminists would say that actually this often simply does not happen. And this often doesn't happen for four key reasons. Firstly, governments only really act when groups are powerful enough to have their views taken into account, and if the government thinks that they will vote for them in forthcoming elections. So very famously, governments or prospective governments, parties that are looking to gain power, very rarely listen to the plight of young people, because young people up until the age of 18, firstly, cannot vote, so they have no voice. And secondly, young people generally don't vote even when they can. Their turnout is very low. So what tends to happen is governments listen to other groups that are very vocal and are far more likely to vote. In particular, we're thinking about the elderly. And that's why it's not unusual for various governments to bring out a whole range of policies which are catered towards the elderly in a hope that they can swing their vote and secure it. Secondly, governments are limited by finances. Some social policies will be too expensive to enforce. So often governments will identify an issue within society and would say, we'd love to try and deal with that somehow. And there may be a policy that would seem to suggest that it could be solved, but when they tote up how much it would be to actually try and deal with it, it's simply too expensive. They do not have infinite resources, in particular money. And so with the finite resources they have, they must decide how best to spend it. So many things often end up on the would be nice, but cannot afford it pile. Next, some policies will cause too much opposition. For example, cigarette companies have been very successful in protecting their own interests, despite the known harmful effects of smoking. So actually, in this particular area, there was evidence that suggested in the late 40s, early 50s, that actually um, cigarette smoke was linked to illnesses such as cancer. But cigarette companies were very good at smothering this research and in preventing governments from 
legislating against the, the use and sale of cigarettes, for example. And so it would not be until the 80s and 90s that really we saw change in this area. So if it's just simply too difficult, or the opposition is going to be too great, many governments will simply step back and say it's not worth it. Finally, governments rarely make dramatic or long-term changes to aspects of society as they are not in power for very long and are concerned with popularity at the times of elections. Also, they are reluctant to commit to changes which will cause major social upheaval. They would rather maintain the status quo. So the governmental cycle generally goes every four to five years and any party that's in power wants to maintain that position of power. And when faced with the option of potentially making a big social change that might upset a large group of people come the next election, often they'll think to themselves, it's simply not worth it. So instead, they'll tinker around the edges rather than making those big wholesale changes. So in conclusion, sociology can uncover the extent of social problems and also suggest causes for those problems and in some regards, even solutions for them. But this does not necessarily mean that they all get transferred to social policy or policies. Many governments often sympathise with the findings of much sociological research, but for various reasons, such as it potentially causing too much opposition to bring about a change or it costing too much money, this does not occur. There is also no agreement among sociologists as to whether they should be involved in policy making or not. Some sociologists would argue that we have values, we have beliefs, and you should have the right to use sociology as a tool to do your research and try and make the world a better place. Others would say it's not our job, it's not our role, step back, look at things objectively, or even you probably can't change the world, you can't change society, all sociology is, is a way of looking at the world that might be useful for you, the individual, but that does not necessarily mean that you have the right to try and change it for everyone else. That's it. Thank you very much.